So 2019 exam, question one. An understanding of Lichtilia's principle is useful in the chemical industry. So Lichtilia's principle is about equilibrium. The prediction can be made using this principle is the effect of the catalyst on rate of reaction. No, Lichtilia is on equilibrium, so the size of the equation. Catalysts on the position of equilibrium. Catalysts don't affect equilibrium at all, so it's not going to be that one. Changes in temperature on rate of reaction, so it's not to do with rate either. Changes in concentration of the reactants on position of equilibrium. D is our answer there because the Chatillier's principle suggests that if we increase reactants, we'll favour the forward reaction, or if we decrease reactants, we'll favour the backwards reaction. And that is all about the Chatillier's principle um, and the shifting the position of equilibrium. Question number two. The thermocline thermochemical equation for the complete combustion of glucose. So we've got complete combustion, that means adding oxygen to it. So glucose, these two here can be ruled out straight away because we're not adding oxygen to them. Now, you should have an idea about the combustion of glucose. This is the same as respiration. And the way I remember it is the complete combustion or respiration equation is the devil's number, which is 666. So therefore, we have 666366. So it's not going to be B, it's going to be A. Um, what's interesting is it tells you the delta H here, so therefore um, that's actually nice to know if we need it later on so we can come back to find the delta H. Um, question three. The a com compound has the following skeletal formula. The molar mass of this compound is what? Okay, so we need to understand what the skeletal structure shows us. Now skeletal structure shows us there's a carbon there, carbon there, carbon there, carbon there, carbon there. Um, it doesn't show you hydrogens, but we need to look at that in terms of how many bonds carbon can have. There'll be three hydrogens here. One, two, three, four bonds here, so no hydrogens at all. One, two, three, so there'll be a hydrogen there, and these will be CH3s as well. So quickly looking at this, as I've got four, sorry, one, two, three, four, five carbons. They're 12 each, so by five is 60. And then I've got three, six, nine, 10 hydrogens, 10 times one equals 70. And then I've got one oxygen, which is 16. So therefore, that makes a total of 86. So the answer there will be D. Important thing is here just to remember how many bonds carbon should have. And if any bonds are missing, that means it's a hydrogen. And then add them up together there. You should also have these um, molar masses in, imprinted in your brain as well. So 12 for carbon, one for hydrogen, 16 for oxygen. So now we're on to question four, which is about oxidative rancidity, and it's being slowed down by the addition of something. Now I've already crossed out two of these options, heat and UV light, because both of these will be adding energy to our system, which would increase a rate of reaction. I'm left with sodium ions and a reducing agent. Now oxidative rancidity is what is when we have fats being oxidized, fats being um, oxidized, and they're forming things like ketones and aldehydes and stuff like that. But what we want to do is we want to stop the fats from being oxidized. By adding a reducing agent, that is going to be oxidized in preference because a reducing agent causes reduction to happen and it itself is oxidized. So that's what that is. A reducing agent is an antioxidant because antioxidants work by themselves being oxidized a lot faster than the other thing that we don't want to be oxidized. So the reducing agent is the correct answer in this case. Question five, um, and it's a long one, a lot of information, but let's try and look at what's actually happening here. I'm going to go straight to down here. At the end of the day, the student checked the color of the half cell and observed that the solution was a darker green. Which alternative metals can be used for half cell one to make it darker green? So I've got a idea here, I'm changing out this electrode and this went a darker green colour. So what means if it's going darker green, the green comes from our ion. So the green um, colour comes from our nickel 2 positive ion. So it has to have an increase in nickel 2. So that means our reaction in this half cell must be this reaction. So therefore, what must happen to form this reaction here? I need to go to my electrochemical series. Now I'm forcing my nickel, where's my nickel here? I'm forcing this nickel to go back this way. All right, so therefore, what my thing over here, what um, metal X must be, it must be somewhere along here. So we can have a diagonal down um, redox reaction occurring. So which of these would actually cause that to happen? Zinc, 
zinc sits below it, so that can't cause my reaction to happen because it won't that won't work. Lead will, so lead is the answer. So lead is will cause the solution to become darker green. Cadmium, um, cadmium sits below nickel, so it's not going to be cadmium. So we can cross off those two. And copper, copper, yep, it's definitely going to do the job because it is sitting above my nickel as well. So the answer here will be metals two and four, which is B. So my next question, question six, which of the following statements about enzymes is correct? All right, so we're looking at enzymes, so I'm thinking about shape, I'm thinking about active site and so on and so forth. The induced model, so the induced fit model suggests the shape of an enzyme remains constant. That is incorrect. Induced fit means that the shape actually adapts to the, um, to the, to the uh, site. Um, the induced fit actually means the shape adapts to the um, shape of the substrate to an extent. Enzymes may have their tertiary structure altered during a catalyzed reaction. That is incorrect. Tertiary structure is really important because that's the shape of the enzyme. Break the tertiary structure, break the active site, it's not going to work. Enzymes can catalyze most reactions over a broad range of temperatures. That's not right either. And enzymes may change the equilibrium constant of a catalyzed reaction. That is incorrect as well. So let's have a look at what our answer is. I've got nothing for this. It's definitely not right for the equilibrium constant. Enzymes can catalyze most reactions over a broad range of temperatures. That is also definitely not right. Enzymes may have their tertiary structure altered during a catalyzed reaction. This is what I'm coming down to thinking about now because what I've got is I've got the idea of an induced fit model. All right. The induced fit model means that the shape does gradually change. So I'm going to say that that might actually mean that B is correct here. So I'm going to go with B because I went through and I crossed out all these things first of all and then I had to think, well, what is most correct? Um, and I can definitely cross out these three because they are definitely wrong. Um, B kind of makes a bit more sense. I wouldn't say the tertiary structure completely changes, um, but it probably can move slightly to accommodate our substrate. And that kind of makes sense more to me now. Oh, now I think about that. Question seven, a molten mixture of equal parts aluminium fluoride, so that is Al3 positive, F negative, and sodium chloride, Na positive, Cl negative, undergoes electrolysis. So I'm gonna use my electrochemical series here. Which of the following is true about this reaction? Okay, so let's have a look at what I've got here. In my electrochemical series, I'm going to have, um, of my uh, cations, I'm gonna have aluminium and sodium. So aluminium is gonna react here, and that's gonna happen at my cathode. And over here, I've got fluoride, I got chloride and fluoride. So I'm gonna have chloride, and I'm gonna have fluoride. So fluorine here is gonna act at my anode, anode. So let's have a look. Alrighty, so, and they're molten mixtures, so there's no water present, so that's good to know. Sodium metal will be produced, that's not right, um, because we know from this, aluminium's being produced. Aluminium produced at the cathode, chlorine at the anode, no. Aluminium and fluorine is gonna be our answer, which is D. So I've got that there. And again, I'm annotating my electrochemical series with what I have here. Question eight, consider the following statements about galvanic and fuel cells. So a fuel cell is a galvanic cell, in my opinion, um, but let's have a look at what we've got. It's just a special one. The overall reaction is exothermic. That is true. We have to get energy out of both of these things. They produce electricity, so they have to give energy out. Electrons are consumed at the negative electrode. Well, let's have a think about it. Um, electrons, so we have, uh, what's at the negative electrode? Negative is the anode in this, which is the oxidation, and oxidation is loss. So that mustn't be right. So oxidations are not consumed at the ele negative electrode, they're consumed at the positive cathode. Both reducing agent and oxidizing agent are stored in this each half cell, okay? Both the reducing agent and the oxidation no, they have to be in separate cells. You can't have the oxidizing and reducing agent in the same um, half cell because it doesn't work that way. Um, otherwise, you'll get heat coming out and not electricity. You need to separate these oxidizing and reducing agents. Otherwise, you don't get a flow of electricity. 
the electrodes are in contact with the reactants and the electrolyte. That kind of makes kind of sense to me there. Um, electrodes are in contact with the electro reactants and electrolyte. I'm going to say half cents there. The production of electricity requires the electrodes to be replaced regularly. Now that is not always true because fuel cells generally have inert um, electrodes. So I'm going to say that is not true there. So I've either got one and four or just one. So the answer here is one and four. That kind of makes sense to me um, there. So I would be looking at these two. If I had one and one and four, I'll then be doing a pretty much a 50-50 on that one. But it kind of makes sense. The electrodes do contact, are in contact with the electrolyte because if they're not in contact with the electrolyte, you can't complete the circuit. And if they're not in contact with the reactants, you don't get a reaction happening. So that kind of makes sense to me there as well. Let's look at question nine. Uh, reaction energy profile diagram. Whoops. The reaction energy profile diagram shown below. Uh, what have we got here? We're looking for the final product energy and the delta H. So our delta H is the difference between this and this. I'll read this a bit carefully because I just had a glance at the question and I saw it said reverse reaction. So we're going from here to here. Okay, and our final product um, will be this one here. So the final product will be 50. So it's not gonna be um, 40. That's not right, that's not right. Now what we're looking at is, is it positive 10 or negative 10? Our energy is going up. This is an endothermic reaction, so it's gonna be positive um, 10 key thing here is be careful they've said reverse reaction so you're not just going forwards you have to read it carefully they've put it in bold for you so that's nice anyway move on to question 10 which of the following statements about coenzymes is correct coenzymes alter the secondary structure of enzymes that is not true all right coenzymes what they do is they bond to the active site and they change the shape of the active site coenzymes can react with enzymes to produce proteins Kinda, um, I guess that kind of makes sense to me. The reason I'm saying that is that, uh, well, enzymes produce proteins, so sometimes coenzymes can probably bond to the enzymes to produce proteins. I don't love it though. Let's have a keep on reading. The coenzymes can bind to enzymes to make a reaction occur. That sounds right to me. That's actually what happens. They actually do bind to the active site of the enzyme. The tertiary structure of a coenzyme prevents them from binding to enzymes. That is not right. The answer there will have to be C because that is a correct response there. And that is what coenzymes actually do. They bind to the active site of the enzyme and they make the reaction occur. Moving on to question 11. Five mils of ethanol undergo combustion in a test tube of a diameter of one centimeter. The experiment performed in a fume cupboard. The temperature of the fume cupboard is 20 degrees. Which of the following actions will reduce the rate of reaction? So if I want to reduce the rate, I want to either, well, basically stop collisions from happening as frequently. I've got five mils of ethanol. If I dilute, mix that much of a dilute sodium hydroxide, that's going to dilute my ethanol and that's going to reduce the rate of reaction. So that looks pretty good. Alrighty. Perform the experiment with a test tube of a diameter of two centimeters. If I have um, that happening, I'm going to have more surface area. So that's going to increase the rate of reaction. Increase the temperature. That's going to increase the rate of reaction. Increase the volume of ethanol to seven centimeters. That's not going to do anything to the rate of reaction because our um, our diameter is still the same. We're still going to still have the same surface area. So A is definitely going to be the right answer because that keyword dilute. If you're diluting something, you're reducing the concentration. So therefore, the rate of reaction is going to decrease. Let's have a look at question 12. Question 12. A compound has the molecular formula C for H9Cl. Alrighty, so we've got this guy here. Which type of chemical analysis would be most useful in determining whether this compound is a stereoisomer? Stereoisomer means they have, um, well, what is it? It's got um, a different orientation in 3D space. So what do each one of these do? So mass spectrometry, that just finds the molar mass. That's not gonna do it because the stereoisomers will have the same molar mass. Infrared spectroscopy, that's not gonna do it because both stereoisomers will have the same bonds present because that's what infrared spectroscopy does. That goes with molar mass, this goes with the bonds. These are the same in stereoisomers. High performance liquid chromatography or NMR spectroscopy. 
NMR spectroscopy is going to tell you about carbon environments. In stereoisomers, they are going to actually be the same. So it's not going to be that. With most isomers, NMR will do it because it'll have different environments. But stereoisomers, they'll have the same environments. HPLC makes the most sense to me because you'll have slightly different polarities in that. I'm going to say C is going to make sense to us there. This is really annoying because I didn't read the question properly. I wanted to know if it was most useful in determining if the compound has a stereoisomer. It's not going to be looking at it between the two different stereoisomers. All right, so NMR here is actually going to determine between isomers and identify if it does. Okay, the, um, I just had a look at the examiner's report and it actually is D. D makes more sense now when I think about it. Um, I've moved over from high performance click current photography because I wasn't 100% sure and I was looking at it to say if it was a stereoisomer or not. Now it's not asking that, it's saying it if a particular compound has a stereoisomer. So to know if it does have a stereoisomer, you need to know which isomer it actually is. And the idea here is that it could be this one. These guys would not have stereoisomers, however if you had this um, particular um, this particular formula you would have a stereoisomer so what we're looking at is we want to know if it's the difference between these two compounds and therefore NMR would be able to be the easiest one to determine the difference between these two compounds